The Wonders of Top, a thesis by the Houston Outlaws. So, so we're gonna talk about Top today. So, how are you guys doing? I, I have been keeping a really irregular scrim schedule because we have a back-to-back -back matches. So I think I talked about this previously. For those who follows the Gladiators schedule, you might have seen us playing a lot of games. And one of the reasons is just RNG, I guess. Every everyone has a stage. Everyone will have a stage where it's either hard or you 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 become like really really busy for that stage. So for the LA Gladiators, we have like what back to back matches on the first week. Means we play a team, and then the very next day we play a, the another team team, and then on the second week we had back to back matches again, and on the third week we had back to back. We have almost back to back matches again. So three weeks in a row. In the first three weeks, we are gonna play six matches. And then I think we have like a one week break and then we play the Boston Uprising on the last week and then that will be an interesting uh, game. So the next two teams we are fighting is actually Florida Mayhem and uh, Florida Mayhem and Chengdu Hunters. So I think that will be really, really interesting because both teams are teams that do not play GOATs all the time, right? They have other composition and that makes maps and strategies interesting. So those two teams will be uh, teams to keep, keep an eye out for. Hey Yankee Wolf, you are you are a one trick, a Torbjorn one trick. Your audio is fucked. Da 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 da. My audio is fucked. Uh, it should be fine. I see my mic is my mic is oh, okay okay. All right. So, uh, yeah. So today we're gonna talk about Torbjorn because you know when Torbjorn is played in 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 the Overwatch League. Uh, it's often a cheese threat. It's a threat that a team use once and they stop using it. It's not like Bastion, it's not like Junkrat, right? It's not even like Symmetra, where there are there are characters that exist in the game that are inherently powerful and you can repeat strategies again and again. Uh, when you play Torbjorn, because Torbjorn isn't strong enough, right? Tor what does Torbjorn do? Like, really, like, what, what does a Torbjorn do? What, what is a Torbjorn good at? Not many things. In, in the old days where Torbjorn had... Um, uh, had could throw out armor pack to his friends, right? And in the old days where Torbjorn actually had like a really powerful turret, uh, Torbjorn had some niche usage. And I think there were there was this team called Element Mystic that ran like a Torbjorn a turret on Watchpoint Gibraltar. They built it all the way, first point on high ground, and then they use it as like uh they 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 they, they use armor packs to give they, they give the armor packs to teammates so everyone had armor as quickly as possible. They try to get uh, a really powerful turret from the first fight. But the, the current Torbjo now is near useless. Right? The Molten Core is really really shitty. It's a shitty out. It's a completely crap. So in even though it's supposed to it's designed to kill tanks, right? That that's the basis of the the game design for the, the the cooldowns, it doesn't it doesn't do any of that. So it's kind of like Reaper in the way that the the, the concept the concept of Torbjorn uh, wasn't realized because uh, tanks are powerful and because you have ultimates like and you have cooldowns like, you have characters that are just way more OP than Torbjorn. So not only is Torbjorn not strong, he's not even an average power character. He's not like a Mei where you have niche uh, use, use, users, right? He's not like a Symmetra where even your TP has some niche uh, niche value. He's not even like um, a Junkrat where you're playing a few maps and you do have some utility because of your concussion mines and your Riptide is actually quite potent. Uh, Torbjorn in its current state has nothing has nothing at all, literally nothing. There's nothing about him that makes him unique uh, and, and, and not like you. It, there's nothing about him that make, makes him unique. In fact, right, Houston Outlaw here, if they replace Torbjorn with a Roadhog, okay, no, 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 Torbjorn is still better, but strangely enough, the most unique uh, part of Houston Outlaw's composition is also uh, the most replaceable one. So we'll talk about why uh, the Torbjorn is more replaceable than the 76 and the Sombra, right? Because you, you would think that the, the, the Torbjorn is like a lynch pinch. If you play a Torbjorn, why wouldn't the Torbjorn be a lynch pinch of the entire composition? Why why is it re replaceable? And we'll talk about that as well. So I did a PowerPoint slide, right? The Wonders of Top by Houston Outlaws. And we're gonna talk about like the different fights, but before we talk about that, I, I kinda wanna I kinda wanna delve into uh something that happened like the last week and I wanted to give my take on it. Because the last week we had 
a discussion, right? A conceptual discussion where uh, Husna lost lost to Titans one three, correct? They lost to Titans uh, quite handily, and one of the when they lost to Titans, they were playing GOAT in uh, the other map. So in the first map, the cough map, Houston won with Torbjorn. They won with a uh, interesting uh, underdogs composition, and you know everyone was like. <laughs> Is this the day that Titans fall? And Titans is not falling to shock, nor Nixel, right? Titans is gonna fall to the Houston Outlaws, right? This is 900 IQ play from the Houston Outlaws. And everyone was in, you know, everyone was so excited to see what Houston Outlaw could bring to the table. And then enter map 2, enter map 3, enter map 4. And then it's back to, you know, reality sets in. And then you, everyone realized that the, the Vancouver Titans goats is still one of the it's still one of the strongest goats in the Overwatch League and Houston gets smacked. And there were a lot of Twitter polls and a lot of uh, really opinionated people take to Twitter. I mean two of them, uh Ryan Foss, a former pro player and Monte Cristo, and Annalise and a caster, uh, they disagreed with each other, right? I mean later on I think they, they, they reached a consensus, but at the beginning they had like a disagreement where you know Ryan Foss said a lot of people are gonna flame outlaws and say they shouldn't have played so much goats against Vancouver. Uh yeah, and then Monte Cristo was like, you know, disagree. He he would have rather uh, Houston Outlaws play uh, a different composition, play a different style against uh, Vancouver Titans rather than fight Vancouver Titans with the very composition that Vancouver Titans is, is strong in. And then I I I recommend, I highly recommend anyone who wants to know about this topic uh, to watch uh, Monte Musings. So once again, this is not really this is this is more high level concept. Right. This is a discussion of like high level concept where uh, how do you want to go ahead as a team? Like what kind of direction does a team want to take if you have specific weaknesses and strengths? And I think it's I think I just think it's really, really interesting. And I'll put the link up, like I'll put this entire PowerPoint slide in uh, the Twitch comments later on. Uh, but for now, so you guys will get this, like all these you guys can get. This. I don't know whether, if you guys don't want it, that's fine, but I'll just put it up. So if you guys ever want to use it uh, or show it to, uh, like, you know, I don't know, keep it because you want to reference anything on it, then you are free to do so. So, you know, and, and, and this topic is really, really close to my heart because um, Monte, Monte dwelled into a couple of teams. Uh, I think he talked about Flash Wolf because Flash Wolf played uh, was a Chinese team that played a uh, relatively unorthodox composition as well. And he talked about a Chinese contenders team that, that had like a variety. When NA contenders and EU contenders were playing GOATs, right? GOATs and DOTs, they were playing uh, triple support, triple tank uh, for NA and Korea. Uh, ch the Chinese teams were playing like triple DPS, uh, Doomfist, Zaya without a main tank. They were playing really, really uh, weird stuff and they were making it work, right? So they were... A lot of adaptation and it made for really really creative solution uh, to the, the the problem that is goats and dots and monte thought that you know houston outlaws uh, could have gone in that direction instead of forcing your team uh, to play goats dots where your team might not have a strong competent tank players uh, monte thought that you know uh, you should play to your strengths rather than trying to fix your weaknesses and this is a topic close to my heart because in in one of the first contenders team i coach um chaos theory I, I, I met, this was actually my first Contenders game. So this was the first game uh, that I watched a Contenders team play that had my influence in it. It's, I think that's the be that's a better way of saying it. And and you can see Mercy and uh, Moira, right? And I, this is like the, the whole concept of not pl uh, playing to your strengths and not your weaknesses is a concept that's close to my heart because it was something I did when I was in Contenders. So let me emphasize when I was in contenders, right? So uh, at that at that point in time, uh, goats was starting out like the, the power of Moira was uh, the power of Moira goats was starting out. Uh, the Sombra people were experimenting with Sombra, but I think the general uh, compositions that people were trying out so often right then uh, was uh, I believe goats composition. And that was one of the reasons I think why we started with Farah. And we played Tracer because at that time, uh, I thought, I mean, Goats wasn't seen as super strong. And I and, and GNX was like a Tracer, really good Tracer player. So I put Ambition on Farah because he was like a really good Farah player. Uh, he's a decent Genji, but I think his Farah was like way above any of his other DPS. And I put GNX on Tracer because I thought his Tracer was way above any of his other DPS as well. So we have Farah and Tracer, both of their, them on their best characters. 
And then we have these three players. Savior is it's kind of funny because Savior is actually like a mercy soft mercy one trick. So he kind of only plays mercy. So it also it kind of makes sense because uh and he's a really good mercy. Uh he his mercy gelled well with Farah, right? Because if you have like a really strong Farah player and you have like a really strong mercy player, then you def you have like a you have like a teamwork basis that you have like a basis you have a rational a strong rationale to play pharmacy so we were playing pharmacy in almost every single map regardless of what that map was whether it was like a good farm map or not far, bad farm map uh, we were playing pharmacy chaos theory at that point in time was i think the i believe we were last place uh chaos theory overwatch so when i first started coaching this contenders team uh, i think they were last place let me see I think my, was my name? Yeah, I think my name was here. Is here. Uh, I think they were last place or something. They were close to last place. Uh, Chaos Theory two three right. So I stepped in when Chaos Theory was like zero three. So I stepped in when they were fighting Machi Esports right here. Where's it? Here. Yeah, and Machi was actually pretty high up. Like Machi before we fought Machi, Machi was like second place. So Machi was like a pretty strong team, right? And then instead of playing Mercy Zen, which was the common consensus of uh, the teams of that time when you run Pharmacy, we decided to run Moira so that the Moira can actually keep our tank alive. So I wanted the Moira to keep the Winston and the Diva alive while the Mercy pocket uh, the Farah. And, and, and technically this was like an unorthodox style uh, because everyone runs Zen Mercy. But I ran the Moira just because I thought that I wanted to support the Farah more by putting the Mercy 24-7 on the Farah and making sure that the, the, the tank still had a lot of resources. So that, that reminded me, because I went through a similar situation, like a, a, a coaching direction, uh, it, this was like a topic that was close to my heart. So I don't know. I, I Even going through like the entire discussion, even following the entire discussion, I, I, I don't know who was who is right and wrong because I don't know the Houston Outlaws coaching stuff. So I I I have like a rough idea of the strengths and like the the strengths and the character like the, the hero pool of the characters in the Houston Outlaws. But I don't know uh how the coaching staff operates in the Houston Outlaws. Because if you go for unorthodox composition, the there is a lot of pressure on the coaching staff. Like the coaching staff has to do a lot of things. If you play Goats Dots, you have a lot of data, right? You have a lot of data online. You can see uh, different POVs and you can learn from battle teams. And then you you dis you try to pull, uh, you try to copy people's style. You try to learn uh, the, 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 the correct play from the battle teams and then you adapt to your team. But if you play an unorthodox style, right? You play composition that no one has ever played before. Then the, the burden is on the coach to... Uh, formulate all these crazy crazy styles so i don't know about the houston outlaws coaches i think it's a viable direction but uh it's it also it's it's not just dependent on the team it's also dependent on the coaching stuff whether they are up to the task so yeah so once again i, I don't it isn't there's not much take away from it it's just that it yeah there are teams that a huge amount of responsibilities on the play are on the players. So the players come out with a lot of so threats, or the players discuss a lot of stuff, right? And there are teams that uh, where the coaching staff has like a much bigger influence. Like the coaching staff is literally telling the player exactly what to do, micromanaging everything with very little discussion from players. So that the 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 coaching and the player seesaw is always tipping depending on which team uh, it is. Yeah, so I'm not sure what that seesaw is like for the Houston Outlaws, but uh, for the particular style that Monte is talking about, that the Chinese team d uh, do, right? Uh, it's a style that I think it's much more tilted towards the coaching side, and more like the players are just there to just shut up and listen to the coach. So that's like a coaching style, and I'm not sure whether Houston Outlaw is that kind of team. So it might be hard, like it might not even be an option for Houston Outlaws just because of personality, just because of interaction of coaching staff and players. Hey, football! Thanks, thanks for the raid, dude. Thanks for. Yeah, you can find it on over GG too. Okay, so let's start. Uh, so who's not lost? Plays uh, uh played Vancouver Titan not too long ago. And we're gonna look at the first fight, right? The first fight. So. Look at this. Vancouver Titan was nine zero at the time where they played Houston Outlaws, Lost, and and who's. And Houston Outlaws was 3-4, so Vancouver Titans was on their 10 game, and Houston Outlaws was on their 8 game. Houston Outlaws record not that bad. 3-4 isn't that bad. You know, 3-4 is the kind of, uh, uh, 3-4 is 75%, right? You, you, no, not so, what am I saying? 50%. So you, you literally win slightly less than half of your games. It's, it's not the worst, but 
it's not the best either. And I think that's one of the things about this one of the thing about Overwatch League, right? Everyone in Overwatch League only look towards the like the good teams, the best team, the teams on a win streak. And then the teams that are not having a win streak, they're all seen as bad teams. So in everyone's eye, and I think this is like a common thing in sports as well. In everyone's eyes, that's like the top teams. And if you're not the top team, you're like you're the bottom team. And it, it, it's not that it's not like that. They are the like top teams, they are like the second best team, they are like the middle tier teams, they are like the slightly lower media tier teams, etc. Et so Kusan Outlaws isn't a bad team by any means. And it's a team that most teams will have to beware of when they fight them. It's it's not a team that will go like, oh, it's going to be a free win. In fact, in, in, in Season 2, I don't think there are any free wins, right? I know people are like, you know, making fun of uh, Washington Justice, but Washington Justice is by no means a bad team. They are, they are a relatively... Uh, I, w I can't say they're a strong team, but they're improving from week to week. So they are a team that you want to keep an eye out for and you want to be careful as well. They are, they are not a free win. No one in the Season 2 is a free win. Uh, season 1, I think Shanghai was as close to a free win as you can get, but not in Season 2. So if Washington Justice right now plays Shanghai Dragons of last year, Washington Justice would have won. And yeah, so Shanghai Dragons was a different... At, at least the early Shanghai Dragons was like a very different tier altogether. And it feels kind of bad, but... Anyway, that's another story, and I don't want to talk about that. So, Houston Outlaws decides to go for a triple DPS composition, Torbjorn, 76, and Sombra. And this is what, I, uh, this is what a, li a little bit of what we talk about, right? Dante is on Sombra, and uh, Sombra is a really strong character, and I, I like that Dante is on Sombra, right? If you see a triple DPS and Dante is on Sombra, it it's already a scarier Houston Outlaws already. Uh, and Vancouver Titans is, surprisingly, they're, they're playing Sombra and uh, and this is relatively rare because if you uh, look at Vancouver Titans generally they play Anna dots they, they run like Anna and they run a diva stitch run diva and uh, not uh, they run a Zaya and then they just play that particular composition so the only change they make uh, to their composition is literally the uh, literally the Anna the Zen to the Anna and there's no other change but in this in this particular match Titans decided to uh, pick up a uh, Sombra instead of a Zaya and what does that say it says that Vancouver Titans think that Houston Outlaws is going to play a uh, triple DPS right and it's I mean it's, it's kind of obvious why they think that way because uh, <laughs> you have Ahad in you have Link So in and Dante in so you are obviously not going to be playing a, 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 a more standard um, you're obviously not going to be playing a more standard uh uh, goats composition and you will definitely be looking for something a little bit more unorthodox maybe the triple dps composition not to mention that muma has a reputation in screams uh, i'm not going to talk too much about screams but muma has a reputation in screams that, of being like a decent uh, a competent hammond like he's actually a pretty good i i, I think muma is a pretty good hammond so muma is a great tank so I, i'm pretty sure vancouver titans was prepared for who's not lost to play to break out the triple dps Okay, so the setup before first fight, and this is this is the magic of it, right? We 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 look at we look at look at this setup. So Vancouver Titans is moving by Dojo side, Mango Titan is moving by Dojo side, and Houston Laws is moving from main. They're going from main. They're not doing this, they're not doing this. No, sorry, they're not doing straight away this. They are doing this from main, split up to the right. And and one of the I, I caught this counter rotation, which is uh yeah, actually rotating the exact opposite way of the Vancouver Titans, right? Uh, the Sombra and our choice that we, we just talked about it. The Sombra and our choice is because of uh, they are prepared for triple DPS, the existence of cover. Okay, so why does Vancouver Titans take the dojo route? Like, why does Vancouver Titans take this route? Why, why this route? You know, why, why, why this route? What? Transitioning over now to this. So why this particular route? route? Why move by Dojo, right? Because there are many places you can move out of. Oh, this Century is a very, very open map. You could move out this way. You could move out this way. You could move out this way. What makes Dojo a, such a seductive area for the GOATS composition? There is one thing that the GOATS composition is weak at, and that is getting poked. Because you don't really have range, right? It, you don't have range and you don't have uh, a huge... Uh, you huge amount of mobility. Yeah, you sure you you could jump. You have a Winston and a Diva, which means and you have speed boost. Speed boost got uh speed boost got nerf, so you are already inherently slower. A uh, Winston and Diva jump is on a cooldown, which means that you can make maybe one big jump, and then you if the the enemy team move a little bit, if the enemy team move a little bit from the the spot that you jump, uh, you will get kited. So those are the weaknesses of goats, and those were always the properties in which uh uh which formed the basis of the GOAT's counter 
or the the existence of a counter to goats, right? And it just so happened that uh, even with those weaknesses, the weaknesses wasn't wasn't weak enough for triple DPS to be uh, a, a strong composition, at least in the last few uh, stages. But in this stage, I don't think the meta has settled yet. So uh, we will see how it goes, whether triple DPS can really uh, counter the, the goats dots composition. So... Goats dots normally move by the dojo side because it gives cover, which means that if you play triple DPS, you, you can't really poke goats dots here, right? Because goats goats dots gets to set up whatever they want. Instead of uh instead of establishing like uh, a jump point here, so instead of jumping from here, they can move to dojo side, they can move from here, or they can move to here, and they can decide, or they can even rotate all the way to the enemy side and decide where they want to jump. So it's kind of like Pythagoras theorem, you're, you, you want the shortest uh, distance, and how do you get the shortest distance is by uh, taking this curvature here, right? So this curvature, uh, let me let me draw, these are, the, these are the distance to like the point, these are the distance to sort of the point, oh, it's a distance to solve the point. So by moving along the curvature, you, you uh, uh, Vancouver Titans is just trying to find the shortest path uh, to the rotation that uh, Houston Outlaws is going to do. So what's the shortest path if Houston Outlaws continue to go for this rotation? So if if Houston Outlaws goes on rotation blue and uh, Vancouver Titans goes on rotation red, what, where's the shortest path? The shortest path is this. Is this is right this right here? So you, they they don't they wouldn't want to like travel all the way here. They want to stop this area and make a jump, cutting uh Houston Outlaws off. If Houston Outlaws rotate here, then the shortest distance would be Titans would probably move all the way here and make the jump, right? Or or, or wherever. Maybe they move here, uh, Houston move here, and then Titans make the jump like that. But they just want to travel as little as possible against Houston Outlaws. It also increases option for uh Vancouver Titans because this area is there are many many ways to exit this area. There are many many like uh pathways where you can move back to point. There's this main gate. There's like a like a small opening here. You could move to opening, and you just have a lot of options when you play by here. There's a lot less options when you play by here because this is out in the open. So. You don't have much cover. You, less cover means less options. So most people like to push through dojo, uh, just because it gives you options. Yeah, and it also allows you to give get a safe haven for the Ana and the Zen. Because if you play in dojo side, right, you can leave like your Ana and Zen here, or if you play a Zen, you can leave your Zen here. If you play Ana, you can leave Ana here as you push out. So that's why dojo is so appealing because you have cover. You have cover for your support. You have it's a short distance to it. It's a relatively short distance to anywhere in the map, and not to mention you have access to the Mega. Because if you play Sombra, you also have access to the Mega. So let's take a look at uh, the setup. Let's take a look at what happened before the first fight starts. Sombra at the start of the map. Okay. Move on the Arisa, so no Wrecking Ball. This is very odd. We're going to see what the Houston Outlaws want to do with this. Turret goes down. All right, you can see, right? You can see Vancouver Titans starting, starting to jump. They, they, they want to jump. Uh, they need to jump, and if they don't jump fast enough, they're gonna slowly get poked down. And it's starting. You see, Jano is getting hacked. A uh, bumper is getting uh, his armor got removed, and 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 slime got took a little bit of poke as well. And Houston Outlaws hasn't even started. This is just spam damage. This is just uh, Houston Outlaws just you know shooting in the general direction. But the poke war has already started, and Houston Outlaws win the poke war because they have uh they have uh Ahan, they have seventy six, and that just means they win the poke war, and they have Orisa as well, which is actually relatively. Good at poking. I do like the Torbjorn on this point because you can use the ultimate to cover basically the entire thing when you get it eventually. Poke, poke, poke. You put your turrets in a lot of tricky spots, so. All right, and this is the first fight, and you know, first jump goes for a Torbjorn turret, and and it's kind of interesting if you notice this jump. Basically, the entire thing when you get it, you can yeah. put your turrets. Bumpo jump from cover, right? So the, the 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 closest cover before the his jump is actually this pillar right here. So you move to the pillar. Makes a jump and jumps right onto the top of the turret, destroying the top of the turret. At the same time, uh, Muma actually got hacked, and this hack is actually critical. And you will see that uh, Vancouver Titan is gonna win the first fight because of this hack. But let's let's take a look at let, let's take a look at some stuff. So Titan's attacking sequence is Winston, Diva, Lucio, Sombra. What do I mean by Winston, Diva, Lucio, Sombra? So the whole point of uh having of whole point of diving right is uh. From that far away, there is one weakness. You're, you're kind of stretching out your line, right? You're kind of stretching out your line. So the first person in will always be the Winston. The second person in will be the Diva. So Bumpo and Jano. The third person in will be the Lucio because you have you control the speed boost, right? You uh, you, you can move faster. You can uh, uh, react a lot quicker. The fourth person in, uh, it's probably the probably the Sombra or the Brick. But these will always be the three characters that are the slowest. These are the three characters that will reach the area uh, the latest. And these are also the characters that has Technically, uh, 
sort of like the the most influence in the fight as well because uh, the Anna all all these characters have like win condition right all these three characters they are able to, uh, to win a fight because of a single cooldown they have uh, for example Anna has a bayonet and slip that uh, Brigitta has shield bash so a stun and then Sombra has a hack so all these three uh, all these three characters have cooldowns that are fight changing but who stand outlaws playing this way is going to make it just a little bit more awkward for these three characters to do anything right for the Anna to hit like an easy nade because it's just such a far distance for for Huxo to get his bash because you can see you can see where Huxo is Huxo is still over here it's actually still quite a distance behind for Stitch to get even his hack because you know this he's, he's not going to be able to hack this way so he has a hack from the side so it's not easy for Stitch to get a Sombra hack as well so let's see what happens in the entire fight and we'll break down the fight. Turret goes down immediately though. Aharon under a lot of pressure already. As fights try to claim the point early. Looks like pressure already. As fights. So Muma goes down. Topion turret goes down. Muma goes down because of the hack. Try to claim the point early. Looks and Linkso kills Twilight. So here's the question: where's Linkso? Right, throughout the entire fight, we don't see Linkso. Where is Linkso? Looks like they will. Yeah, I wonder if we're gonna see And Linkso is right here. So when Houston Outlaws went for the rotation, when Houston Outlaws went for this rotation, Linkso, the chicky little, the chicky little seven six, he continued along the rotation and took this area. And this is a really, really open map. So this area, this area is by far one of the best spot uh, to, to stand as a hit scan. As a Widowmaker, as whatever characters, you can see like 80% of the of, of, of this of the point, right? Of course, there, there's vulnerability as well. Because this place is really, really weak to a single dive by the Winston or the Diva. So if like a Widowmaker stand here and a Winston Diva jumps you, uh, you could grapple away, but the chances of staying alive is not very high. And uh, same goes with any character. Like 76, if Winston Diva decides to dive Link, so Link so is probably dead. Because this area, it's just, it's just really easy to jump this area. So as this area gets to see everything, it's also an area that's really, really vulnerable to any uh, coordinated dive. But Link so for, like, at this very moment, Link so is safe, right? He's immune to the dive because uh, because Houston Outlaws tank, uh, sorry, Vancouver Titans tanks has to dive or decided to dive the, the, the bunker composition that was sitting right here. And Muma was hacked, so it makes sense. So, Laser Kill likes a couple of people. Slime couldn't even, like, Slime couldn't even push in. Like, Slime couldn't even push in all the way because, yeah, like, if, if you look at this. Alright, sl Slime didn't dare to pick to, to pick out, so he had to, like, stay here all the way. Well, Dante, Dante and Slime actually took out, like, a two... Uh, set up like a 2v1 situation. So this is also one of the, the set plays of Fustan Outlaws, where they have like a bunker composition over here. Muma, uh, Ahan, Rockers, Boink. Uh, Linkso and Dante is actually setting up. So uh, so it looks more like this, right? Their rotation goes this way, but there's, there's two characters that, there's two characters. One character continued this way to set up over here. The other character cut into point. So sort of pincering uh, uh, point itself, right? The, these two characters are actually pincering uh, the back line. So, so who gets pincered? The people that are slower. So who are the slower people? Uh, Anna, Brigitta, uh, Sombra. If the Sombra is stealth, then you can't do anything about it. Or if the Sombra is always stealth, and even the Lucio. Because the first two characters they're in, right, the, 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 are the two tanks, right? The Winston Diva always reaches the point first. So these are the, the other four characters are the characters that they will be uh, trying to kill. Critical thing that they were actually kind of close. If Muma didn't get hacked, this would have probably, like, this would have probably went the way for Houston Outlaws. Houston Outlaws' composition was designed to win the first fight, and they actually didn't win the first fight. So, honestly, honestly, at this point in time, right, not winning the first fight is is disastrous for Houston Outlaws. Right at this point in time, if I was like a betting man, if both teams played perfectly uh, from here onwards, uh, Houston Outlaws actually has like a really good shot of winning. But Vancouver Titans will go on to make two or three mistakes that will cause them to lose this point and hence cause them to lose this uh when i say lose this it just means that who's not long managed to retake it really really quickly and i'll show you guys what it is okay so what and this is this is where we see torbjorn one of torbjorn's uh, ability right torbjorn if you see torbjorn uh if you see ahan play he used overload almost immediately right here he used overload almost immediately right oh there we go, Overload, right? And one of, the, one of the things that Overload does is it's a huge amount of damage in a very short amount of time. So top use of Overload, look at look at how much, let's look at how much damage Overload does. Uh, where is it? So it does 125 per shot, right? So per right click, it does 125 damage. And there's no fall off because, yeah, I know there's a def uh, Diva defensive matrixing, but let's assume that there's no defensive matrix. That's like 125 per shot. Uh, 
uh, half on the e fire. Okay, 1.6 shots per second. So he does about 1.6 shots per second. So in three seconds, 1,000. How many how many shots did he how many shots did he land? How many shots did he try to land? One, two, three. So he, he landed three shots. So three shots is uh, about 370, uh, 375 damage. So that was 375 damage on the bubble. And they were actually supposed to break the bubble as quickly as possible. That was Muma's and Ahan's uh, main priority. Break the bubble as quickly as possible and make sure that uh, Bampo and Janu uh, need to spend all their resources, right? They need to use their bubble. They need to use defense imagery. They need to use it as much as possible. Spend as much resources as possible on the Banco defense as the two, as the Ling so and Dante went for like a flanking journey. But they, they didn't manage to do it because of Muma got hacked. And Muma being hacked means that he's not he's going to die really, really quickly to the con coordinated effort of Vancouver Titans. So, yeah. So even though the overload here looks kind of scary, it actually got eaten up by a, defensive, a really good defensive matrix. And Muma also didn't manage to stand his ground. If Muma stood his ground a little bit longer, right? If Muma had managed to not... If Muma didn't get hacked, uh, he probably would have been able to uh, fortify himself. He would have uh, stayed alive for way longer. I, I, he would stay alive for like 5, 10, like much longer. And during this time, Ahan would definitely break down the Winston bubble. They would definitely be able to... They would definitely be able to get a lot more out of this flank, but they didn't. So, and hence they they lost like a really winnable fight. And here's the power of I'm gonna show you guys the power of cheese. So this is the power of cheese. This this is the power of cheese. Take the first capture here. Do the so. outlaws switch out? This is the power of cheese. Bumper just fed into seventy six. Right, look at look at Bumper. Two hundred eighty health. Capture here. Do the and this is the power of cheese. Bumper. Uh, in, 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 it's, I mean, it's kind of unfortunate, really, because I think he thought Janu was going to follow him. I think, did Janu follow? I'm not even sure whether Janu followed him. Janu did follow him, but I'm not sure how much defensive matrix Janu have. And de defensive matrix is not like a, an ability that, uh, some, it's, it's not like 100%. Like, depending on the angles that the, 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 the other character is firing at, uh, not all damage gets, uh, not all damage gets mitigated. So this is, the power of cheese is just, you know, Bumper just forgot how much damage like a 76 does, right? He, he, he thought he could put pressure on the 76, but... So this actually does like a huge amount of uh, damage if you don't have bubble, if you don't have a photon barrier, and if you don't have, uh, if you didn't land your jump pack, and if you didn't, yeah, it just does a, a huge amount of damage. And that's, that's more of the power of cheese, right? And, 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 and it's something that, Eric Gladiators know a lot about because we, we, we cheese very often. So the power of cheese is just, you know, people start stop remembering like other what other characters do and even the weaknesses of uh, particular characters just because uh, it's not in the meta. So for example, stuff like Bastion, right? If you don't play Bastion for a long time and then suddenly you break out a Bastion against like the, one of the strongest composition, you forget about it because you get complacent. It's just... It's, the power of cheese is just, it's not strategy, it's, it's psychological, it's physiological. Human beings just forget about how... Uh, human beings forget things easily. So even if something is strong or something has these strengths and these weaknesses, you forget about all these as long as we play goats and dots 24-7. And that is something that I think teams are starting to realize, uh, at least Kusta Outlaws realized it uh, against Vancouver Titans, right? There is a lot of uh, chance to cheese out other teams. Uh, and, and how much you want to cheese uh, is, is, depend is dependent on your coach because your co I think your, your coaching staff has to be like uh, has to know what they're doing as well because cheese doesn't mean like random composition doesn't mean it's a good composition right if you play Symmetra Junkrat uh, Symmetra Junkrat Baptiste and oh, or you play a 6 support composition right that, that isn't a cheese that's, that's just a bad composition a cheese is a it's, it's like a really comp it's sort of like a complicated composition that doesn't look strong but when you actually play it you realize that it has strengths that you couldn't see from at the start so that's like the power of cheese and 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 who's not lost is attempting to use the power of cheese it sounds like a it sounds so weird it sounds like a manga power right the power of cheese but it, it is it is a strategy to cheese out your opponents and yeah and it makes for very entertaining games as well so Bumper dying here is really, really, really critical for Houston at loss because if Bumper doesn't die here, right? If Bumper doesn't die here, it's I'm pretty sure that Stitch is gonna get uh Stitch is gonna get EMP and Bumper just 
Bumble could just do these things called like pressure dive, right? So as Who's Down Laws try to push in, it's going to be really, really hard for Who's Down Laws. Bumble will be like harassing, Stitch will be setting up, and I'm pretty, pretty sure they will get Primal Rage and uh, EMP for the next fight. And that's going to mean it's almost impossible for Who's Down Laws to win this map with this composition. This very jump right here, right? I would go so far as to say this is like an anti-POTG. If there's like a POTG, it's, it's kind of harsh, but this is, this is an anti-POTG. This jump right here, lost Vancouver Titans the map and 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 yeah this jump right here lost Vancouver Titans the map and even after making this jump who start lost also make a, a, a series of good play that we will talk about but this jump here was critical in losing the map because cough cough is a really RNG map when I mean it's RNG I mean uh that it's not like payload where uh different fights this fight is important right the first fight or second point may be important so let's say the payload moves this way the payload moves this way and this is the second point and this is the third point this is the first point right a hybrid map and then you have one fight here, you have one fight here, you have one fight here, you have one fight, that sort of stuff. So maybe two fights from point to point. Maybe this fight, you, your teams generally have like a 60% chance of winning if you have more outs. This fight, you have like a 70% chance of winning if you have more outs. So teams start to uh, adapt strategies uh, uh, depending on which part of the maps you're fighting at, right? And you change compositions to suit the map accordingly. Uh, and a lot, some of the maps, they are really, really like different uh, Area from area, you see different compositions, see, you see different style of play. Like, a more aggressive style of play, a more defensive style of play. Uh, uh, um, an example would be Icon Wall, where you have like the street phase, you have the first point and the third point, and in all three different points, you could play three different compositions just to suit the particular terrain. But in KOF, right, the party is all in the first fight. The party is all in the first fight. It's, it's mathematical. The, you are the first one to start the, 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 the tick on the point. So you, the, your chance of winning is just a lot higher, even if all the other fights pan out accordingly, just because you started first. So you're going to end first. So... This jump right here, even though Vancouver Titans won the first uh, fight, this jump here right here negated all the advantage they had from the first fight. And Houston Outlaws played perfectly as well. So I'm going to show you guys what I mean by Houston Outlaws played perfectly. The Houston retake. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Now it's going to be a six okay, so let's let's look at what happens next, right? Vancouver Titans have five v six now, but let's look at what happens next. Temporarily here for the Outlaws, they're going to have a chance to retake. Yeah. Links six versus five temporarily. Here. Outlaws, okay, this, this, this is. I'm just going to call this the power cheese as well. It's obviously yeah. the power cheese. Links has been really taking names on the soldier too. They just forgot, like they, that's like a helix rocket into uh helix rocket into good tracking, but everyone just forgot how well, how much damage a seven six can actually do. Everyone thinks seven six. It's, it's just a water gun. It doesn't do any damage. It does a fuck load of damage. It just, it just doesn't do a lot of damage against armor. And against a lot of tanks, it doesn't do a lot of damage. But in a one-on-one -on -one situation, 76 will always be able to do like a, a, a fuck ton of damage. A metric ton of damage. 76 is a really good one-on-one -on -one character. <laughs> it's just, it's almost, it's actually almost funny watching like Link Soldiers run around sniping people. Okay, the camera work needs to, <laughs> it's a little bit detailed. Oh, oh, so right actually thinks he can beat the 76 in a one-on-one. -on -one. You wish, Stitch. You wish. It wasn't, it wasn't even, it wasn't even close, dude. Like, do you see Link So He, he was so... He was so luxurious in the way he put down his Baltic field. He was like, Hey, it's like a Sombra shooting me. Turn around. Hey, Stitch. Throw his Baltic field. Like, there was no rush. Like, he's, not even, he's not even rushing to throw down his Baltic field. He's turn he, he turns around and he, he realized, wait a minute, I can't win this one-on-one -on -one if I don't use Baltic field. ADs a little bit. Toss out a Baltic field. Continues the one-on-one. -on -one. Wins the one-on-one. -on -one. It isn't even particularly good play from Ling so like it's the correct play but like we could put like a random grandmaster or a random even a master player right here and a master player will do the exact same thing uh it's 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 just the power of cheese. The power of cheese, where you forget what the 76 does. And it's also like, it's also kind of bad because the only person that can take out like the 76 like really, really easily, it's technically the, the, the Winston. 
Like the Winston is sort of the, the, the best counter to 76 right here. So if Linkso was pushing up right here, if Bumper was still alive, right? If Bumper was still alive, this push right here. they're gonna have a chance to retake. Yeah. Like this push right here, he would have been jumped by Bumper. So Bumper would have maybe jumped this and asked uh, Stitch to uh to help him out. Or maybe like Bumper alone would single-handedly fight Linkso one-on-one -on -one and, and and probably even pro maybe even primal to win this fight. But the prop Here's the problem, right? If you don't have a Winston, no one else can win the 76 101. I mean, you could send the Diva, but the po the problem about the Diva is a, a Diva is an off tank. It's it's not very easy for a Diva to win the 76 101 if the 76 knows why he, he 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 if the 76 knows why he can he like 76 know how exactly how to play. And it's also really really hard for any other of any other of these characters to win one on one. It's also hard for these characters to push Dojo. Like, it's hard for these characters to actually try like move towards Dojo and not take a uh, severe amount of poke damage. I mean, yeah, you have a shell, you have speed boost, it, but it's just it's just inefficient. It's not impossible, it's just inefficient and easily dealt with by like a competent 76. So you needed the Winston, but the Winston wasn't here. In fact, if Janu died, like Bumpo survived and Janu died, and it's a 5v6. I don't. I think Husna Laws would have still lost. The only reason why Husna Laws had such an easy time pushing in was because Bumpo died. And that's the importance of a main tank. Hey Rex, <laughs> licking. Yeah. So the uniqueness of Winston's initiation. That's why Winston is strong because Winston initiation and his space control, right? His explosive uh, way of taking space is unparalleled, and no one else can. It is Winston's equal. Uh, maybe maybe Hammond would have been the closest. I think Hammond is like the closest character uh, in terms of uh, ability to take space, right? In terms of the nature of how you take space, uh, the closest uh, to Winston would be Hammond, but nothing else comes close. <laughs> yep. So Titan's attempt, Titan's method is also like kind of interesting, right? There are many ways you could set up like but they decided to stand on point because they were they wanted to stop Hustan Laws from pushing any of this area. So the, the 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 best way to do it is actually just to to stand as close as possible. And the, the this dojo is not even the shortest place to everything. The shortest place to everything is standing in the middle, right? So if this is a circle, the shortest place to everything is the center of the circle. But without the Winston, uh, you no longer every one of these dive will be weak because you don't have the Winston. So. Vancouver Titan is just overextended. What they should have done was either just give the point over to Husan Outlaws, but they were greedy. Uh, and you'll, you'll see later that that's one of Titan's arguable weakness. They are very greedy about things. They, 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 they will stay because they think the fight is winnable. And many times a fight is winnable as long as the enemies make mistakes. But this one, this very time, it's not one of those times. Okay, so this is Vanc This is the second pivot point. So the first pivot point was when Bumble died, right? And then, uh, that, the it, you know, it went to the Hussan Outlaw. Who the, the chance was a lot higher that Hussan Outlaws was gonna win the fight. This is the second pivot point. It's the second pivot point because. Bumpo and Stitch are gonna Bumpo and Stitch Vanco Titans can use their will, will get the ability, the chance to set up their ultimates right now. And if they use everything and fail, let me repeat, if they use everything and fail, or they use most of the ultimates and fail, this is probably their last chance. Because this fight will push this to 50%. They will not get another chance to get so many ultimates. Look at how many ultimates they have. They have these out, they are they're close to bomb. They'll probably get some barrier during the fight. They'll have this, they'll have Rally during the fight, they have Primal and their MP. If they lose this fight, they will there will be no longer any situation. There'll be no other situations where they have this amount of ultimates available to them. And this is important because uh, Houston Outlaws does not have a defensive ultimate. They do not have a trance, they do not have a sound barrier, which means that as long as he set this up correctly, they should definitely win this fight. So let's see what happens. Laws are spread out all the way across the point, though, so they really put themselves in a, yep. a good spot as far as avoiding a lot of that EMP. So they start with EMP, right? So does that mean Titans won? I mean, this is this is one of the most basic combo of all time, right? You EMP, you nano your monkey, let your monkey go in and do all the work, right? And monkey try to get monkey to kill the seventy six, try to get monkey to kill the NI, etc. But this is where this is where Link so. Uh, saves Houston Outlaws from sure defeat. Vancouver Titans right now is a lion, right? So you have Houston Outlaws trying, just trying to bunkle, like just trying to stay alive in this part of the map. Uh, Vancouver Titans, however, is stretched out this way. It's stretched out this way. They have characters ranging from this area to this area to this area, and they are just stretched out. So 
the Link Cell coming in from the side is trying to weaken the push of the Vancouver Titans because Slime does, still doesn't have a uh, sound barrier. So if Slime had sound barrier right now, then the problem is solved. They can actually ignore 76. If they if Slime use sound barrier right now, uh, everyone can just collapse on who start loss and ignore the 76. But because Slime doesn't have a uh, sound barrier, uh, they need to send the Diva towards Link Cell. They need to send Janu towards Link Cell. Why not the Winston? Uh, no other no other characters can do that, right? Because the Sombra is here, everyone else is here. The only person that can move is Janu. Because you, you need Bumper's damage. You nano Bumper, right? Bumper use a bubble, a jump pad, and a nano just to break the bunker composition. So it makes no sense to use all these cooldowns to jump a 76, they'll probably run away. So you're gonna send he will send he will they will actually send just send like a single diva. But that also means you weaken the amount of damage you do to to to, to Houston at loss. Because if you remember if you look at Vancouver Titans, they do not have a Zaya. They do not have a Zaya. They do not have a Zen. So the amount of damage they actually do, it's not a lot. Because a Zen and a Zaya are, the, are, are a huge amount of damage, right? When you play Goat Stones, Zen and Zaya are the two characters that does like a huge uh, metric fuck ton of damage. They don't even have a Reinhardt. And Reinhardt does a lot of damage as well. You have a Nano Winston, but when it comes when it comes down to it, a Winston actually doesn't do that much damage compared to like a Zaya, Zen, and a Reinhardt. So that, that, that is the crux of it. Hey, so yeah, so Diva moving towards losing the Diva from this dive, uh, losing the Diva from this dive is is game losing, right? It's game losing because they they will no longer have enough damage to take down who's out loss. So you know, Diva runs here, Linkso runs away, and same thing. The Linkso playing seventy six right now. I'm not saying Linkso is a bad player, far from it. Linkso is a really good player, but the way that seventy six is played here is utility, right? This player right here. He could be replaced by a master grandmaster player, not because Linkso is bad, but just because of the nature of his role and responsibility, right? You could replace this character right here by any master player, like a high master player, a grandmaster player, and he'll probably get the same thing done. So th that is, like I said, the power of cheese. That's the power of cheese. The power of cheese. It's like the Powerpuff Girls and shit. It's it's actually a superpower in terms in the Overwatch League. The power of cheese is just uh, making sure that. You know, the power of cheese is, 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 it isn't mechanical, it isn't super high coordination. It's it's just unpredictability and the lack of uh, the lack of being able to think up a counter on the spot. And it's even more potent against teams that uh that doesn't have like a strong shot caller. Right? It's it's kind of like remember LA Gladiators, we played the bunker composition in uh, Hanamura's second point, and we're playing like oh we played weird stuff like Orisa Winston and other characters like Chengdu playing three triple DPS, Chengdu uh or oh, the first time that the Zaya Dufi's uh composition was played, right? As long as you sort of play cheese competently, the enemy team will see for the first time, and not only do they have to play well in a contenders uh game, or not only do they have to play well in an open diff game. They also need to solve your problem. So you're literally just coming in and you're saying, you know, GOATS is the strongest composition. Or this this team is like, this is the strongest. This this coin right here is the strongest composition. But we don't give a shit. You know what? We're going to give you a Rito. Let me flick it away. Like, you, you, I'm, I'm going to give you a Rito. Uh, 1 plus 1 equals 2. And it's up to you to solve that problem. So not only does the enemy team need to uh, play well, they need to first solve the problem, solve the riddle that the enemy team posed to them. And it's a very, very powerful tactic in even open division and in contenders. I think there are many regions like contenders, open div, you can actually cheese your way through many of them. So if you are like a really smart coach, and it's not easy, right? Smart coach, or you have like really smart players, and you create compositions that counters the meta composition. If you play Goats, maybe you have a way they can uh, force everyone to stand in your molten core. Maybe you play Torbjorn and Mei and trap everyone in a room that they have to rotate through and everyone dies in the molten core. That's all that. If you have ways to cheese, right, uh, you almost always beat like 99% of the teams that are not in Overwatch League. And you'll probably beat a couple of Overwatch League team too if your cheese is good. And that's one of the problems, I guess. Uh, cheese is a lot more easy uh, to to, to, to create in open division and contenders and it's a lot harder for you to do in uh in Overwatch League. Because in Overwatch League all the players are objectively smarter. They have more experience, they have more experience coaching stuff. So it's a lot harder to cheese a team. Right? It's not impossible, it's just a lot harder. So your cheese, your quality of cheese has to be 
a lot higher. But in open defense contests, I'm telling you, if you if you play May, you play Symmetra and shit or whatever, right? Ninety nine percent of the matches you will win. But that uh, that doesn't mean that like, you should start cheesing now because it's not easy to cheese, right? You actually have to come up with the Rido first, right? It's hard to solve a Rido, but someone somewhere created the Rido, right? So sure, maybe you solve you are good at solving Ridos, but are you good at creating Ridos? That's the thing, and the answer isn't always yes. Like, just because you know how to solve uh, mathematical problems doesn't mean you can create the method. You, you can create addition and subtraction. The people that created uh, addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, all those, they were geniuses, right? They, they reinvent mathematics. They, they, they created a new way to look at things. So that's the thing. The power of cheats, right? It's not about playing stupid composition. It's about creating a composition that is good against uh, a, a particular meta or like it's good against in a certain map, but it puts severe burden on like the coaches and it, it requires the coaches to be like immensely competent. Uh, or the players to be, I'm not saying the coaches, the, the players could come up with like insane ideas as well. Or it requires the players to be immensely creative. So maybe Jake came out with this cheese, maybe Tyrone came out with this cheese, we'll never know, but we know that Who's Not Lost does have uh, the, the ability to come out with really dangerous cheese as Vancouver Titans found out. Okay, let's go. Yeah, I, I've start. I, I, I'm, I'm swearing on stream. It, 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 apparently it's fine. So yeah. <laughs> so you hear a lot more fuck of me. Fuck, 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 fuck. Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna go that far. Shit, I shouldn't have cursed that much. All right, never mind. Yeah, let's go. Uh. Yeah. So Stitch EMP as well, but yeah, they just don't have enough damage. Look, look at who's now lost HP. Just look at who's now lost health. But they don't have enough damage. Mm, uh, 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 no. Nope. Uh, 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 that's also why they're playing Anna Mercy because there's there's so much more healing. Oh no. Oh, I haven't actually died so. That one doesn't really get a lot for the outlaws, but they are still gaining percentage. Titans so nearly flipped the point, but man, nobody seems to be able to handle Lynx or D Max oh. finally. Stitch takes him down. Yeah, they had to use the E. Yeah. D Max oh. finally. Stitch takes him during his one. There's Snouches are back on all to use three to get the arms. Between some mind games right now. Slime way across. All right, he's got the Titans in his sights, or at least he'd like to think so. More like he's got the Titans. Oh, crap. And here, here comes the second thing, right? Dante's POTG hack. So we talked about the Nano EMP. We talked about how they lack damage. But here's the second thing I want to talk about. Dante's POTG hack. So we talked about how uh, uh, Linkso, Linkso pushed that pivot point. Could, it was it was immensely down, but it wasn't a mechanical ability. It's more of like his role and, respon his role and his responsibility for that particular team fight was to uh, stop... Uh, Vancouver Titans from coming out with, with a powerful engage, and as long as you weaken his en their engage by removing the diva, they immediately don't have enough damage to deal to the Houston Outlaws. Just because they don't have a Zen, they don't have a Zaya, they don't have the characters that that actually brings the damage to the Goat's composition. Uh, and this is the POTG hack. Look at look at that. Uh, look at the hack, right? Look at look at bumper. Look at bumper right now. So they're really low. They're really low. The nano boost ends. The nano boost ends, so if right as the nano boost, and this is one of the main part about EMP and nano combo, if you EMP the Winston, the Winston goes in. Even if the Winston doesn't kill anyone, everyone will be on low on HP. Bumper will also be low because nano doesn't make you invincible, right? You you will die to like a huge bunch of damage from everyone in Houston Outlaws. But if you use Primal, the amount of space you create is immense because going in as nano you create three or four seconds your team is able to do anything they want the price of it the currency you pay the money you pay is your ultimates and your cooldowns so you you use jump back you use bubble you use uh nano you use um yeah you use these three uh abilities and you go in and what you get is three or four seconds where your team can have more space more options more everything but you can extend this three seconds to like seven seconds how do you do it by using another ultimate right so you pay you pay more it's like on you're on the pay phone and you pay you put in like 10 cents you put in a pet like a quarter and you, you're able to talk for five minutes but there's a way to extend that but you have to pay more so in this case huxer is going to use his rally but bumpo needs to use his primal rage and if he uses primal rage i'm 99 sure who's not lost losers 
But this is where Dante comes up with like the greatest hack of all time, or at least in this round, where he hacked Bumpo and stopped the Primal Rage. And Bumpo dies here. This is Vancouver Titans' second best chance. So their, their first chance was, their first period point was went all the way back here when, when Bumpo fed, remember? Bumpo made this, made this jump. And this was hard feeding, right? And Vancouver Titans almost lost. They, are, they had a second chance to... Uh, uh, Vancouver Titans was probably going to lose. They had a second chance uh, uh, available to them, which is this fight. And it was hard because Lynxo tried to stop. But Vancouver Titans could have still won as long as Dante didn't get out the heck. But Dante got out the heck. And, Van and, and Who's Not Lost continue along their path of winning, of going... Of being able to being a team that that was going to be able to take a map of the Titans. And then Papo uh, makes his second mistake. Bumpo should be resetting. They don't have enough damage to take out uh, Houston Outlaws. They they no longer have any Nano. They no longer have the Brigida. Brigida does a bit of damage as well. And Janu doesn't have his mech. So these characters, right, If since they don't have a Zaya, they don't have a Zen, they don't have a Reinhardt, which are the characters that does damage? The the, the Sombra does damage. The, the Winston does damage. The Brig does damage. The Diva Mech does damage. You lose Huxo. You lose Janu. Stitch is slipping. So right here, even if Bumpo primals, their chance is gone. So Bumpo needs to make, and this is actually this is actually the part where it's hard. Right, this is the decision part that a master player, a grandmaster player, will not make the correct decision. Bumpo to make the right decision here, he needs to keep his primal rage. He needs to not primal. It's not winnable this, anymore. Still Another hack on the stitch as he lays down, gets taken out eventually as well. And, now and Bumpo goes for it. Don't do it, Stitch. Uh, slime, don't do it. <laughs> Even the, the casters are laughing as well because it's kind of painful to watch because yeah that that was they need do you know why the sound barrier and the primal rage is so important because if you switch composition against Houston Outlaws let's say you play like the goats composition you you decide to play goats right which actually goats will work against this composition like if if you play the Reinhardt version you probably would beat the shit out of this composition this composition is bad it's not a good comp it's a cheese comp the power of cheese any composition like. 70-80% of the composition that you can come up with will beat this composition. Maybe triple DPS can't beat this composition. Or oh, it's really hard for triple DPS to beat this composition. But Goats beats this. Dots beat this. Uh, even 2-2-2 two, two, two probably beats this. But uh, there are conditions. You need ultimates when you want to transit. So this is the power, the, the cost of transition. When you change a composition, everyone ultimate charge starts from zero, right? So this is what I call... Uh, the concept of outs to build outs. If you keep your primal rage and your sound barrier, you could use those two ultimates. Even if you lose the fight, you could use those two ultimates to build the ultimates for the other four characters in your team. So in this case, if they switch to dots, right? If they switch to dots, or even if say Bumper screw up his primal rage, right? If Slime doesn't use his sound barrier and they change to the Reinhardt uh, variation of uh, goats, right? Their sound barrier could have been used to build a graviton search. You might not be able to build like hundred percent of a graviton search, but the fact that you have sound barrier will be able to you will be able to build your ultimates of the other characters way faster. You'll probably get like thirty percent more, forty percent more, and those those are critical. But because Bumpo uses out, because Slime uses out, they no longer have this thing, the outs to build outs. So they will move into the next fight with zero ultimates, with, with near zero ultimates. And this is the hard part. I know Slime is close, but there's no way Slime can farm EMP. The whole point of Sombra, the power of Sombra is that Sombra needs to get EMP fast, right? And efficiently. But who is Sombra going to get EMP from? You can't get the, the Orisa because Orisa is bunkering, bunker defense. You can't fight the Sinks one-on-one. You can't go for the Torbjorn. The Torbjorn is hiding, probably hiding behind the shield. You can't farm the supports because the supports are very close to the bunker composition. So Stitch right now will find it really, really hard to farm uh, any ultimate. And Huxo, it's even harder for Huxo to farm his ultimate. He, he, he's a Genshi. There's no one he can go for safely. You can't even go for the back line because the, there's a freaking Torbjorn turret in the corner of the map where Ahan is going to shift the position. So there's literally no way that these two DPS characters can farm their ultimates unless, unless they had ultimates. Unless they had a, a Primal Rage or a Sound Barrier where they could have had their two DPS found. So even though this composition right here is a strong composition and is, has the ability to beat this composition, it's too little and it's too late 
they're gonna lose this fight already. It's it's been set in stone the moment uh Bumpo the moment those two mistakes were done, right? All the way stretching from Bumpo feeding in the first fight, uh Bumpo feeding in the first fight here against the 76. So this 76, this is the first call mistake, uh stretching into the second fight where uh you know Huxel death here was almost in like all these deaths here were insignificant. Bumpo, that was a pivot point. The second pivot point is the heck right here that Dante managed to get out. The third pivot point is probably uh the, this primal rage and uh, the sound barrier right here that they wasted right at any of these moments as long as as long as they they don't do the wrong thing they had a chance to win it back but as you as these pivot point move further and further into a cough match your the chance gets lower and lower and that that, that is the base that's the premise of the overwatch league right you have a couple of uh, you have op op options uh, available to you where you can change the tempo, win the fight, full hole, whatever. At, at that point in time, you need to make the right decision. If you make the wrong decision, you lose. You make the wrong decision, you lose. So, and the, the better teams you fight against, the less options there are available to you. There are less options because they just make less mistakes. But they will always make mistakes. Nixo is not close to perfect. Nixo makes like 10, 20 mistakes that every team can, gets to punish, even in like a small time frame, in, in a... In a 30 seconds window, they probably make like a two or three mistakes. But is your team able to see it? And is your, once your team see it, is your team able to capitalize on it? Because if one person sees it, right, it's not as easy as one person seeing the mistake and going, we won, we saw a mistake, right? For example, let me let me show you guys like uh uh let me see Twitch. Uh, so for example, a mistake that I I'll show you guys like a gladiators one. Uh, let me see, let me see, let me find. Game 1. What is the mistake we spotted? I mean, I'm gonna show it again, I'm gonna show you guys again. Do you see it? The, the team spotted Agility standing here. So sending a diva bomb in between Agilities and the enemy team, uh, we get to go, we get to collapse on Agilities right here. We get to kill Agilities first. So that, that's one of the mistakes that uh, a, a team can spot, right? Uh, just by someone out of position. And most of the time, the out of position is just one meter, two meters in Overwatch League. And then not only do you, can you, you, do you need to spot them, so spotting it is a skill set that uh, uh, players need to learn and in contenders very little uh, I would say in most teams can do it in tier 1 in tier 2 might not be able to do it uh, after you spot a mistake you need to have a, a good enough voice comm right you need to have a good communication structure so you tell your team exactly what your team uh, should do so you need to say if you say like uh, rush with diva bomb for example rush with diva bomb the bricks out of position you need to do it efficiently and then the rest of your team must be competent enough to understand so that they execute. The bomb doesn't get get sent up to the sky. The bomb doesn't get sent up to the wrong area. So everyone needs to be competent. And that requires a communication, like comm structure. That requires a, a strong shot caller. That requires competent player that can spot mistakes, right? So it's not easy. It's not easy. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think that's, I'm going to end my stream soon, but this is the, uh, this is, the, the wonders of top by Houston Outlaws. I'm gonna send. I'm gonna link these slides as well, so you guys can check out the slides uh, if you guys want. I I no longer need this slide. Uh, yeah. So the cup the concepts that we covered today was um. Uh, the, the power of cheese, right? I think it's an interesting concept. The power of cheese and. Uh, and I guess just pivot points, right? Moments in times where you can you can staunch the tide of battle and switch the victory to your team, but if you make the wrong mis if you make the wrong choice, you will never be able to do it. So many contenders team. Why the reason why contenders team doesn't look strong, right? When you look at like I don't know, even any contenders fight each other and all that, is because they're not they, they can't spot mistakes. So they are not able to spot someone out of position and make a play or at least consistently. They operate off using ultimates. So they just uh, most contenders team they're gonna fight and they go like. Let's use these two ultimates to win, and they use it. But 
they're not punishing mistakes. They're just using their resources, and it's not super efficient. It's like a guy using a like a bazooka to to try to take down a, a tank. While uh, punishing mistakes is kind of like understanding the entire army, uh, like the the, the the tank itself, right? The tank is like an army tank. Uh, being able to spot mistakes is like understanding like the blueprint of how this tank work. Maybe this the wheels are weak, and throwing a grenade right at the wheels break down the wheels and stop the tank from moving. In which case, you can go in to kill the person. Uh, and and one of the reason why it's good is because it's efficient, right? Because if you use a single grenade and take down the tank, it's cheap and efficient, and that means you can save your bazooka shot for uh, a more a more important target rather than wasting bazooka shots to win the fight. So that's the power of uh, opportunities and that's the, the powers of just having a player that can spot these mistakes. So even if you see a contenders player that has good aim, right? You see a contenders player, oh, this guy has good aim. This guy Widowmaker is as good as the other Widow, as Pine, right? It doesn't mean they are as good a player because there's so many other things that you need to be able to do well in. You, you have to be able to spot mistakes. You have to be able to call well. You have to be able to so many different five different things it's not just about how well you aim and that's what most people think right it's, they think it's just how well you play tracer how well you play video that no that's like the most basic baseline you need to at least be that for overwatch league teams to look at you but other, after that what makes you better than the other video maker that can also hit five headshots in a row okay so 